Hello, everyone. So nice to see all of you today. Hi. My name is Alex, and I'm going to be teaching you about Georgia O'Keeffe today. So welcome to Kids Art Lab, all about Georgia O'Keeffe. I'm going to go ahead and um, start sharing my screen with you in just a moment. But first, I wanted to tell you that the project today can be completed with just whatever materials you happen to have at home. So I am using just a piece of paper and some crayons with some variation in color. Um, so that I can do some extra shading and, and have some variations of this purple. You'll see why in just a little while. Um, but that is really all you need to complete your project for today. And if you don't have crayons, that's fine. Use colored pencils, markers, whatever you prefer, okay? It's going to be just basic materials today, but you're going to end up with a gorgeous project by the end of it. So let's go ahead and get started to learning all about Georgia O'Keeffe. Here we go. Wonderful. Okay. So, welcome. Georgia O'Keeffe was born in 1887. She passed away in 1986. So, she was almost 100 years old. And she was an amazing woman. She was one of the very first female artists to gain worldwide fame. For her art during her lifetime. So just for some perspective, um, this is the world, obviously. We live over there in Florida and then right around, maybe not exactly where I put that black X, but around that area is New Mexico where Georgia O'Keeffe ended up. Um, although as you'll learn in just a little while, she did a, quite a bit of traveling but she ended up living in New Mexico um, at the, uh, the end of her life for a very, very long time. So, and again, a little bit closer. So we have us in Florida over there on the right-hand side of the map. And on the left, you can see a pinpoint there where uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's home and studio are located close to Abiquiu, New Mexico. So that's not very... Um, far from Santa Fe, if you know where that is in New Mexico. I think, I believe it's about 60 miles away from there, right by Abiquiu. Georgia's background. So, surprisingly, she was born at a dairy farm. Her family had a dairy farm in Wisconsin, and she was born there in 1887. She is the second of seven children. Seven children. That's actually her sister Ida on the left there in that photograph. Um, she and the rest of her siblings started art lessons at a very young age at home. Their mother thought it was very, very important that they um, have a background in art and in culture. Um, she continued to take art classes throughout her time in school, and her sister Ida was also an artist. Um, she did some um, some shows as well, although that did create a little bit of tension between Georgia and her sister Ida. Georgia went on to study art in Chicago and in New York City at art institutes. She taught art herself in Texas and in South Carolina at schools. Eventually, when she was still teaching art in a, in a public school, she was able to connect with an art gallery owner in New York City, Alfred Stieglitz, who is um, right there in that photograph with her. He fell in love with her art and displayed it at his gallery and um, was one of the reasons why she became so well known. They did eventually get married um, and he continued to display her art. Um, he himself was a famous photographer in New York City. He owned a gallery um, where a lot of famous artists um, displayed their work. Georgia continued to travel throughout her life all over the U.S., but she did eventually settle in New Mexico and renovated an old Abiquiu home that I will show you in just a little while. And if you know who Ansel Adams is, another famous photographer, that is the person who took that photograph of Alfred and Georgia. This was Georgia O'Keeffe's home and studio in the Abiquiu village. So fun fact, Georgia bought this home for $10. Yeah, you're not hearing me incorrectly. 
dollars from the church that owned it at the time. That was after 15, so five, 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 15 years of um, negotiations with them. Um, at the time, the home was completely falling apart. It was not livable at all. Uh, Georgia was able to eventually purchase it and renovate it by and respect the outside of the home and, and fix it in a way that was um, was respectful of the culture and of the history behind the home. Um, so this is this is the outside of that Abiquiu home. And then the outside in the back, one of the reasons she fell in love with this property was because of this garden back there. Um, all of this is still open. Uh, you can go there and visit it. There is even a webcam, like a live webcam of the garden itself. So if you log on to um, the museum that's located here, um, you can click on the webcam to view the garden in real time and see what it looks like throughout the year. Obviously, this isn't a, like a traditional garden, like what we would find here in Florida. Looks very different, right? So the outside of this home, is it the traditional? Um, adobe kind of clay exterior but then when we look at the inside they left everything just as georgia designed it so you see all of that very modern furniture um the flooring is all very modern white walls she installed large windows to be able to look out over that garden and the beautiful landscape outside um but she still has you know like the the traditional ceiling um, so it's a very interesting mix of old and new, traditional and modern. I think it's so interesting to look at. It's very, very neat. We've got those like mid-century pieces of furniture, cool lines, textures. What do you think? Does that look comfortable to you? <laughs> Would you want to live there? Okay. So, Georgia was a modernist. Now, what is modernism? Do you all know what that means? Have you heard of it before? It was a movement in the late 1800s through the mid-1900s. So, they rejected realism and neoclassicism, excuse me, <laughs> so, and valued change freedom of expression, freedom of experimentation. They wanted to be able to try new methods and new mediums and make things that hadn't been seen in art before. Now, when we're talking about realism and neoclassicism, that means art that essentially looks real. You know, paintings that show almost exactly what things look like. Like if I were to paint a picture of this plant. We're talking realism, it would look exactly like this. If we're talking modernism, it might not necessarily look like this. You might just get the idea of it or the colors or, well, you'll see when we talk about our project later on. So this is a photograph from 1960 of Georgia O'Keeffe as an older woman um, outside her home in New Mexico. She's working on one of her paintings from the pelvis series, series that we'll talk about a little bit later. And you can see the landscape in the back. So she's channeling the same colors and feelings from the landscape into her painting. But it doesn't necessarily look like that, does it? If you were looking just at that painting, would you be able to tell that she's, she's actually painting some animal bones that are found in a landscape like this with these colors? No, without that context, you might not actually know. So this is a good example of modernism. It doesn't look exactly true to life, but it evokes feelings and ideas. Okay, quote from Georgia. One day I found myself saying, I can't live where I want to, go where I want to, do what I want to. I can't even say what I want to. I decided I was a fool not to at least paint as I want to and say what I wanted to when I paint it. So you might not feel like you can always say what you're thinking or do what you want 
when you want to. But you know what? You can put those ideas and those feelings into art, whether you're painting, coloring, making something from clay, or even out here from nature. You can put your ideas and your feelings into that work and channel that and say what you want to through art. So what medium did Georgia use? Most of her paintings are oil paints, which are pictured right here. Um, but she also played around with watercolors, charcoal, and pencil, just sketches. So really, you can use whatever you would like to. So we're going to go through some of her paintings to give you an idea um, of her work. This is from early in her career, from 1917, Evening Star 3. This is watercolor on paper mounted on board. Um, so it's like just mounted on um, some kind of like foam board or, or a piece of wood, probably. Um, she painted it while she was teaching art in Texas. So she was a young teacher when she painted this. Uh, and it shows the broad open landscape of Texas. She talked about walking home from school at the end of the day while the sun was still up in the sky. It wasn't dark yet. And there was this open wide road that they would walk down. They were surrounded just by, by open air. And this evening star was always visible, even though it wasn't dark yet. It was way high up in the sky on her walk home. So she's got very wide brush strokes that are surrounding that evening star that go and gradiate in color from the yellow, it fades to the orange, to the red, the blue, and the green. So you have the idea of that landscape, but with those modern like shapes, the circles, and then the lines. What do you think? If you'd like to pause the video now and talk about what you think about this painting, please do, okay? Okay. This one, very different, not too much further from, um, from the time when Evening Star 3 was painted. This is painted in 1924 from the lake. This is oil on canvas, so she's using oil paints on traditional canvas. Um, and it was inspired by her trips to Lake George with her husband's family. Now, every summer, they would go on trips to Lake George and stay there. And Georgia did not always love those trips. I think she wanted to spend time by herself or just with her husband, but she was surrounded by his family. And sometimes we don't always get along with our families, right? So she created this abstract landscape of Lake George. Now the colors are a lot darker than the evening star that we saw on the last page, right? And we've got some really interesting shapes that are here. We've got some curves, some sharp, jagged pieces. Can you see the cloudy sky in the top? And do those shapes from around like the second, the bottom half of that painting, do those remind you of waves at all? Maybe there's some reflections in there, some light being picked up on. See there with the yellow and the white. We've got some of the lighter green and lighter blue. I love looking at this painting. It feels very, mm, very stormy, maybe kind of reflective of the weather right now. I don't know if you can hear all the wind, I'm hoping it doesn't rain, but I like this painting a lot. Okay, on to the Shelton with sunspots. I'm gonna see if I can move this right over here. The Shelton with Sunspots was painted in 1926. It's also oil on canvas, and this was a painting of the hotel where Georgia lived with her husband as a newlywed in New York City. Now take a second and stare at this painting. Can you tell immediately that's a, that it is a tall skyscraper? You've got those tall rectangles, the other skyscrapers that are surrounding it. They're kind of dark, kind of closing in on the Shelton there. But at the same time, you have the sun that's reflecting off of the building itself and creating those sunspots to so the circles that you've got all over the canvas. You've also got the clouds 
and maybe the smoke that's coming in and surrounding it. So you can't really see the other buildings that are behind it because of those colors and that smoke coming in. I like how the, um, the sunspots are a different color and they're giving the, the canvas some interest in the front, in the foreground. And you almost can't see near the top of the Shelton because of that sun that's reflected there. So you've got some play with, with the shapes in this one. What do you think about this painting? Cool. Okay. Next we have, boop. Oh, maybe. Okay. Oriental poppies from 1928. This piece is all about the color, isn't it? It's also oil on canvas, and it is a magnified or zoomed in view of two giant poppy flowers. Now, if you look closely at the painting, there is no background color. No, it's just the flowers themselves. She extended the color to the background, and there's very, very um, detailed shading going on here. You've got so many different shades of that reddish orange. You've got the dark centers of the flowers as well. It almost looks, uh, excuse me, looks like a zoomed in photograph, don't you think? Georgia did a whole series of flowers like this, and this series is one of the ones that she's most well known for as an artist, although she has lots and lots of different work that's not related to flowers. Okay, next up is Cow's Skull, red, white, and blue from 1931. Oil on canvas again. And this was painted shortly after her very first trip to New Mexico. Now, this is so different from the poppies that we saw on the last slide, right? When Georgia went to New Mexico, she was fascinated by the nature that was found there. She found animal bones like this, skulls, um, the different hills, red hills, the clay that was found in that area, the different kinds of plants. So if we're looking at this cow skull, it's got some curves that are very soft. And, and then in the center of the skull, you've got those very sharp, jagged points. Kind of very different there. She surrounded the skull by the colors of red, white, and blue because this she felt was reminiscent of America's enduring strength. So the fact that this skull has stuck around in this landscape, a very harsh landscape, it's very bright, not a lot of rain, really hot. So that's stuck around for so long. Interesting. What do you think? Okay, next up. The Chama River Ghost Ranch, 1937. Now, before Georgia was able to buy that Abiquiu home that she fixed up, she used to stay at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico. Um, now, that is still a functioning place where you can go to learn about Georgia O'Keeffe, and you can also stay there overnight. Um, I thought that was so cool. Maybe one day I'll be able to go and stay there and learn more about Georgia. Uh, but this one is also an oil on canvas. It is a landscape of a river from where she lived there. So this is an interesting perspective. It showed off this area's very unique makeup to an international audience. So this area had not gotten a lot of attention worldwide up until this point. And I don't know about you, but I feel like this landscape here, it looks so different from, from here, from Florida, from anywhere, really. We've got the red of the hills, all that dirt, and then the contrasting blue in the background with the mountains and then with the river coming down too. And again, she's got some very, very interesting shapes, this curves, especially that one in the front there, the curving direction of the river. What do you think about this painting? You can pause it again and talk about it with, with your siblings or with your caregiver. How does this painting make you feel? Okay, on to our next one.
Okay, our next slide. If, well, there we go. <gasps> Pelvis two from 1944. This one is again an oil on canvas. And like we were talking about where I had that photo of Georgia in front of the red hills that were surrounding her and that painting that she was working on, this is a part of the same series when she was painting animal bones. So it explored the shapes of the bones and had that zoomed in or magnified view. So if we're looking at this, this might be, you know, a pelvis of some sort of animal. But instead of painting the whole thing, she took it and zoomed in on one section that had some interesting shapes and decided to paint just that. So you've got the white of the bone and you've got the blue of the sky peeking through. And you have those soft, the grays on the side that show the texture of the bones. What did you think this was before you knew it was a bone? What do you see in it? I see a lowercase g. <laughs> but I wonder what else it could be. Hmm. Kind of reminds me a little bit of a bird. Hmm. What do you think? So another quote that I loved from Georgia says, my painting is what I have to give back to the world for what the world gives to me. So you notice that most of her painting was based on nature, right? Or how nature is affecting man-made landscapes. It's like that series that she did on skyscrapers in New York City. So the world is giving that to her and then she's reflecting that in her art and giving it back to the world. I think that's pretty beautiful. Okay, now before we get to our project, I wanted to talk just a little bit about where you can find some more information about Georgia O'Keeffe if you'd like to learn about her. We have a database on our website that is called Gale Kids Info Bits. It's a great database to do research for school or anything that you're interested in learning more about. So when I typed in Georgia O'Keeffe, it brought up some interesting biographies on her. If you want to read a little bit more and deeper into her life. There are photos of Georgia O'Keeffe, magazines, news articles. So all of that is there and accessible with your library card. If you would like to, um, to pull it up on our website under our e-library and go to Gail Kids Info Bits and find more information about her, okay? Okay, now let's make some art. We are going to make nature souvenirs as art today. We're gonna to create artwork inspired by things that we can find in nature. So I already picked my piece. So I am going to create some art based on this flower that I found growing outside my house. Hmm, what do you think? I think it's beautiful. Got some different shades of purple. If you have a magnifying glass, this would also be a good time to use that and really look closely at whatever you decide to use. You don't have to use a flower. You could use a succulent, a leaf, a stick, some weeds that you find in the yard, a shell, a rock, anything. But I want you to look really, really closely at whatever it is. Look at it like you've never seen it before. Use your magnifying glass. Or if you don't have it, just take your eyes and look very closely at whatever you choose. Like when I just glanced at this flower before, I didn't notice almost that deeper purple that was inside there. Hmm. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Now we're gonna do a project together. So I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can exit this and go back to 
just me. Da, 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 da. Let's make that bigger. Okay. So here we go. I will just have Georgia in the background here. So we're gonna create some art. Now I'm asking you to please take up the whole page with your art, okay? We're gonna take up the whole page. So I'm gonna start with just an outline in the lightest purple that I have. I'm gonna outline the center of my flower right here. There we go. And I'm just gonna mark off some of the edges of my paper. Because I want the color to fill the whole paper. We're gonna have a magnified view, just like Georgia did with her artwork. Okay, I see, and I'm looking really closely at my flower. I see some lines there that go from the center out to the corners of the petals. So I'm going to take a darker purple and draw those. We're gonna go out. I'm not gonna make straight lines because most of nature doesn't come in straight lines. Got some curves, there we go. Yeah, I like that. I'm gonna take a different purple and I'm gonna add those, what are those called? The stems and the center of the flower. Those are gonna come out from the center there. And the center of my flower is much darker than the rest of the flower. So I'm gonna start with my darkest purple that I have and start coloring the inside there. make it go out like this. Now, it does not matter if you are not the best artist. I am definitely not the best artist, but I still like making art. I like being creative in whatever way that I can, especially when there's a lot going on in my life, like there kind of is right now. Not, not everything's normal right now. If I am able to be creative in some way, it takes my mind off of it. And it really makes me feel better. Sometimes I can put my feelings into my art. And by putting them down onto the page, whether that's through art, if I'm, if I'm drawing, or if I'm making something from clay or even from Play-Doh, or a little bit different if I'm, you know, writing in my journal, putting that down in some physical form really helps me work through it. Have you guys tried that before? You feel the same way? Okay, I've got those dark colors starting from the center and going out to the edges right there okay this is where i'm at so far now the colors get lighter and lighter purple as they go out further and further so i showed you at the beginning but i'm going to show you again the different color purples i got so darkest and we're getting there we go maybe lighter and lighter i'm going to take my next lightest color and just start filling this color in. Now I'm going really fast to show you, but normally I would take a little bit more time and a little more care coloring in and, and trying to work on shading, going from darkest to lightest, but I'm gonna just try to hurry along and show you so that you can get started on your own art. Have you decided what you're going to make yet? 
Are you going to use crayons or colored pencils, markers, or even paint? What are you going to use? What kind of medium do you want to explore with today? Medium is the kind of tools that you're using, kind of art. So sometimes I like to try something different, like charcoal. Maybe you could even use chalk. Make the same sort of thing. That way you could use your finger and you could blend the colors together. I like that idea a lot. Okay, now I'm going to use a slightly darker shade. This one's got a little pink to it too. I like this color. So I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna overlap a little bit with that other purple so that there's not a huge contrast between the two. So I'm not doing like a line in the start of a new color. I'm trying to blend them together a little bit so that it's not completely noticeable where one color ends and the next one begins. And I'm just gonna go around and around and around. I'm using the same, the same direction for my crayon when I'm filling it in. So you've got those lines starting from the center and going out. Remember, going out to the edges of the paper. I don't want your flower to just be right here. It's gotta take up, or flower, rock, whatever you're making. I don't wanna see all the edges on the paper, okay? I want it completely filled out past the edges of the paper. Okay, I'm gonna do this real quick. We're gonna fill out this one. So since I added those lines on there, I've kind of got quadrants of my flower. So I'm just gonna fill out each one, one by one by one by one, overlapping the previous color. Cool. And now it is time for my last color, which is the very lightest purple that I have. And I'm just gonna fill it in all the way, the edges of the paper. That's okay if you go over the edge there. I've got a clipboard behind mine. If you're doing this on a table, you might wanna put um, some kind of covering over your table so you don't get crayon all over it. Unless that's okay, of course. So I'm gonna color all the way to the edges. Ah, oh, cool. I think I'm gonna go back though, once I finish coloring this portion in and make those lines that are going out from the center a little bit darker because now that I've filled it in, you can't see them as well. So I'm just gonna go over them with a slightly darker crayon just to make them really pop, okay? Here we go. What do you think? Do you still, can you still tell that it's a flower just from this? Or might you not know initially until you take a closer look or see what my inspiration was? All right, I'm gonna move this here so that I can get to the end of the paper over here. Use those same strokes with the crayon all the way to the edge. All the way. So remember we're filling up the whole paper with color, whole thing. You can even do this in black and white if you don't wanna use color. That's fine too. But whatever it is, I want to see it covering the paper. I'm going to take this darker, kind of pinkish purple, magenta maybe, and go over these lines just a little bit more so that we can see them. Here we go. Still, they're going to be not exactly straight, because again, not always straight lines in nature. Everything has a little bit of movement to it. And here we go. It is certainly not perfect, but 
that is my Georgia O'Keeffe inspired art, inspired by nature. Here we are. Now please go do your projects, take pictures, share them in the comments below. We would love to see your work. We can't wait to see your smiling faces back at the library. So have a wonderful day, you guys, okay? Bye.